Hey church family, so this is different. If you are at home, this doesn't seem too wild, but if you are in person, you've obviously noticed that I am on the screen and not in person. The elders decided that uh, since I had been around some people that are symptomatic and COVID positive, it was best that I followed quarantine protocol. And despite Larry's suggestion that they just stick me in the drum set and behind that cage, we decided that a recorded sermon was the best way to go this week. You also notice when you walked in this week that the communion elements are sitting in your seat. So we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper today, and those are there for you. And if you have a gluten intolerance or allergy like I do, these gluten-free bread were uh, in the bowl outside of the sanctuary doors when you walked in. If you didn't get those, take a moment, put on your mask, and go and send one person to get those for your family. If you are at home right now, I encourage you to hit pause and go and collect some supplies to celebrate the Lord's Supper with us after the message. It does not have to be anything uh, too in particular, uh, some juice or wine and a uh, cracker or bread, and we will celebrate that. Even though we're not together in person, we can be together in spirit. We are continuing our series on the Apostles' Creed. I want to ask you a question this week as we go into this. The question is, is there anything that God cannot do? Is there anything that God cannot do? Take a minute and think about it. There's a popular question you've probably maybe heard before. It's uh, the question, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? Well, we're going to see today if there's anything that God cannot do. And since this is the series on the Apostles' Creed, I would like to start out with us reciting this together. So let's do so. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So we said there, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And last week we looked at this seeing God as the Father in three ways, that he is the creator of all things, he is the Father in the Trinity, and for those of us who are following Christ, we have been adopted in as children of God. This week we're going to do the second part of that and look at this from the side of God being almighty. So what does that mean for him to be almighty? We're going to do that by jumping into the middle of the story about Job. I would strongly recommend that you read the book of Job. It's a long book for scripture, but particularly it would help to read chapters 29 till the end this week to give you context about what's going on here. But we're going to explain this so we know what we're looking at. If you're unfamiliar with this story, what happens is Job is a uh, really good guy. He's pretty wealthy. He is a pretty moral guy. He is what we would say is a good person. And all of a sudden, a spiritual being that is called an accuser comes and says to God that Job only loves God because of what he has. And so God gives this being permission to uh, take things away from Job with the only restriction being that they cannot kill Job. And so this is what happens. Job loses. He loses all of his assets. His animals and his buildings are destroyed. Inside of those buildings are his kids. All of his kids die and then he is covered in painful sores, and all of his friends are on his case. They're all saying, Job, what did you do wrong that God is punishing you? And so he's lost everything besides his wife and his life, and his friends are on him. His wife is telling him, just curse God and die already. This is miserable. And yet for the longest time, Job holds tight to his faith, and he says, 
Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I hope that I have that same kind of faith to say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, if I have to go through anything half of what Job is experiencing. Finally, though, in chapter 29, Job starts to crack in. He starts lobbying accusations against God, and it's kind of passive, but really what he's doing is saying, what have I done? Why are bad things happening to a good person? Shouldn't a righteous person be blessed? And then at this point, a friend of his, Elihu, steps in, and he starts explaining to Job's friends and to Job the way that he sees things. He sees that good things should happen to good people and bad things should happen to bad people. So we're coming in here at Job chapter 34, and it's verses 10 through 15 are going to be our passage today. Let's read that together start. Therefore, listen to me, you men of understanding. It is impossible for God to do wrong and for the Almighty to act unjustly. For he repays a person according to his deeds, and he gives him what his conduct deserves. Indeed, it is true that God does not act wickedly, and the Almighty does not pervert justice. Who gave him authority over the earth? Who put him in charge of the entire world? If he put his mind to it and withdrew his spirit and breath he gave, every living thing would perish together, and mankind would return to the dust. So as we look at that, the first thing I want to do is take a look at the title that Elihu is using for God. And that is, in your English Bible, it's going to say Almighty. It is the Hebrew word Shaddai, or El Shaddai. And this word, it uh, comes from the uh, Akkadian language, where it meant um, the Lord of the mountain, or the God of the mountain, the Lord or God over the wilderness, over the chaos. And in fact, in the Iron Age, and so that's, uh, Assyria and Persia and Babylon, they start taking this term and using it as political propaganda. So they take this term that in Hebrew is going to mean the one who overpowers, the Almighty. And they start using it for their king, saying that our king is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Our emperor is the one that extends his rule over all things, and it dominates the chaos out in the wilderness. I want you to remember that. We're going to come back to it here later in the message, the fact that they are using this for the Lord of Lords or King of Kings who is in control. This term is going to be used 48 times in the Old Testament, and 31 of those, so two-thirds of those occurrences are here in the book of Job. So let's see what Elihu is saying here about the uh, Father Almighty. And to do that, we're going to look at the passage uh, just a little bit out of order. We're going to start here with verse 11, where he says, He repays a person according to his deeds. He gives him what his conduct deserves. In other words, Elihu is just saying that God is just. And he is speaking about the doctrine of retribution. In other words, someone who does something good deserves good repayment. And if you do something bad, you deserve to be punished. And he's pretty, pretty solid on this idea here in this passage. He's going to go on and we're going to assess what Elihu is saying after we're done looking at the passage. But I want to point out here, verses 10 and 12, Elihu is going to talk about the negative stuff, what God is not or what he can't do. Often we use these negative descriptions because God is so amazing, he's so big, he's so uh, incomprehensible for our tiny little human minds. It's easier for us to say, okay, God is all of this except for this, this, and this. It helps us understand this is what he's not and this is all that he is. So we look at this, he's saying here in verses 10 and 12, Listen up, it's impossible, it's impossible for God to do wrong, for the Almighty to act unjustly. In other words, it's impossible. It is ha leo, which is uh, coming from the word, uh, we would have looked at this when we studied Leviticus together, that was used for the ceremonial laws, especially for like food that they couldn't eat. 
It means something that is profane or reprehensible. Uh, the, the form of this is saying that uh, I am so far away from that. It's impossible for me to be that or do that because it is so reprehensible to me. I am far away from it. What is God far away from? What is it impossible for him to do? He says it's impossible for him to do wrong. Resha, which means evil behavior. It means to sin, to do something wicked. Psalm 5.4 tells us we, that God is not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil cannot dwell within him. As well, he cannot act unjustly. Avel, it means he cannot be dishonest. He cannot do something that is an act of injustice. And Elihu says in verse 12, Indeed, it is true that God does not act wickedly. That's that same word for sin. The Almighty does not pervert justice. The Almighty does not yawet mispot, meaning he doesn't suppress or pervert what is just. So what this is saying is, yes, there are literally things that God cannot do. God cannot sin. He cannot do evil. He cannot perform an act of injustice. In other words, what this is saying is, God cannot act outside of his nature. God is who he is and what he does. It's, it's his essence. It's who he is. And so these things that he does are good, and anything that he is not is what's wicked. He is just not those things. They are so far from him. In Scripture, we see other things that God cannot do. He cannot lie. He cannot die. He cannot be substandard. And he cannot go back on his word. So the answer is yes. There are things that God cannot do. And no, God cannot create a rock so big he can't lift it. Because his omnipotence, his all-powerfulness means everything that he has created, all of heaven and earth outside of himself, is under his rule and control. If he creates a rock, he can lift it. Then in verse 13 through 15, it answers the question. Elihu asks the rhetorical question, why is God in charge? We're going to see that he is the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Who gave God authority over the earth? Who put him in charge of the entire world? He put his mind to it and withdrew the spirit and breath he gave. Every living thing would perish and mankind would return to dust. So, just like Acts 17, 28, God is the reason that we live and have our being and take our next breath. He's sitting on the throne. He is in control. So what do we make of Elihu's position here? And to understand that, really, it would be necessary to read the rest of his speech, like I suggested reading the final couple chapters here of the book of Job. But I want to examine this and show that he kind of gets it right and he, he gets it wrong as well. So what does Elihu get right here when he's telling us about the Father Almighty? So he gets it right that our Lord, is not like the other gods. The Almighty Father does not just mindlessly run over and plow down humans with pain and suffering simply just because, or because he's careless or doesn't care. Unlike the gods of the ancient Near East that Elihu and Job are familiar with, these gods were thought to just do whatever and essentially be the divine version of a five-year-old stepping on ants in the backyard. John Walton describes this saying, God, he, is not incognizant of people and their situations. In contrast, God's inexorability is guided by a firm purpose. The strength of his heart with which God is characterized is the opposite of indiscriminate neglect. Instead, he has a determined posture and steadfast policy regarding his treatment of humanity, though... That does not mean he is predictable. And so what that's saying is God is just and he is in control. And Elihu has a problem with what he has said about God. The problem is, is not with this principle that God is almighty and that he is in charge and that he is in control and he is all powerful and he is just. 
The problem is with how Elihu and really Job's other friends have taken this truth about God and then they've misapplied it in the application with Job. What they've done is they've said this, how God they've seen him act is how he's always going to act in every situation. And they've done that with no thought about um, eschatological retribution, how God is going to do things when he returns and judges the world. And they've done it not thinking about God's great mercy or his compassion for people. Now, this is a extremely important thing to note. So if you are at home, uh, turn up the volume. If you're in the service, wake up. Let's write these things down here. What Elihu has done is that he has correctly understood a fact about God. He has got this theological principle, this doctrine about God. He has got it correct. He knows that God is just. He cannot act unjustly. He cannot sin. He cannot be wicked. And yet, despite getting that doctrine right, he has misapplied it in real life. Outside of the textbook, he misapplies it. So did, do you get why that's a problem? What that means is you and I are capable of reading the Bible or listening to a very well-crafted sermon and getting facts about God correct, but then butchering our application about what that means in our lives. And there has been a lot of bad preaching because of this. And there has been a lot of horrible thoughts that are carried out by churchgoers around the world because of misapplying the text, taking what this means in Scripture and then how that fits to us today. And so when we look at these things, the thing is, we have got to be praying for discernment and we have got to be reading our word often and well. But even then, don't be intimidated because you may be saying, well, I'm not going to seminary or I'm not this or that. And so how can I do this? The basic truth is it is important to be reading scripture. You get the context of the whole book, knowing what God is and what he does in praying for discernment and being open to correction by God and by solid teaching. And so when we do that, we are careful and how we apply scripture to ourselves. This is what Elihu has done, is that he has seen God's almighty, powerful justice and sovereignty over all of creation, and he has missed God's compassion and his mercy and the long-term vision of the story of scripture that we are able to have. What we see in all of scripture and what Elihu is missing is that all of us are worthy of divine retribution. In other words, I deserve God to judge me and pour out his wrath on my sin for all of eternity. That's the very message of the gospel is that I deserve justice to be served to me. And yet God is not someone who's going to do injustice. He's not going to be unjust, there is a third category that God exercises through the plan of the gospel, and that is non-justice. In other words, God is just. He has to punish sin, and that is why he comes and is Christ, 100% man, 100% God, lives a sinless life that deserves no punishment, and yet takes on my sin on the cross taking my sin and putting it on Christ and taking Christ's perfect account and putting it on me. And so I've received non-justice and Christ has received non-justice and yet God is still just. And Christ raising again from the dead and ascending into heaven from where we know he will come back, that uh, I am able to be free of the punishment I deserve through faith in him. And so if you're following Christ, you've received that same non-justice. And as well, if you are someone who is not following Christ, 
We'll have up our contact information after this message. If you're in person, talk to Dan after the service. And we can explain to you what it means to follow Christ and how you can step into this family of God and be free from the weight of your sin. So, Elihu here has missed the mercy and compassion that God is offering us through his sacrifice for us. He is missing the fact that, yeah, God is almighty. He is the creator of heaven and earth, and he is just and cannot sin. But Elihu seems to think that God is manageable, that he can be compartmentalized, and he is predictable, and that Elihu, just a human being, is able to fully comprehend God and predict what he is going to do. But if we read through the book of Job, or at least these last chapters, as I encourage you to do, we see here that um, what we've observed in our daily lives, day after day, that there is chaos, that um, things are not predictable like we would think they would be. And I love David Atkinson writes here that reality is much less clear, manageable, and predictable than we would like to think. The divine wisdom we are realizing is not merely something that we can get if we think hard enough or behave well enough or if our theological system is coherent, tidy, and clear, the divine wisdom, as we shall see, comes by the way of the storm and the whirlwind. That phrase, storm and whirlwind, refers to the fact that after Job complains and Elihu speaks, God comes and corrects Job. And he appears as the storm, as the whirlwind. And God comes and he puts Job back in his place. God is the potter. Job is the clay. And God's answer is a reminder that he, in fact, is the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and of earth. And he does this by showing that we as humans are not able to comprehend how God's plan is in place. The Almighty has everything ordered throughout all of eternity. But what we see is some order in nature or the world around us, we see a whole lot of people making a whole lot of bad, random decisions, and we see chaos in the world around us. But what looks like chaos to us is under the control and rule of the Father Almighty. In chapter 38, God uses the analogy of, hey, what if Job was God for a day and tried to do God's job? That Job clearly has a lot of limitations. And speaking of his rule and sovereignty over creation, God points out that he is the one who has created, who sustains, and who rules over all of creation. And he's going to say here in this chapter, it's weather and animals and stars and everything. In Job 38, 1 through 4, then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, and he said, Who is it who obscures my counsel with ignorant words? Get ready to answer me like a man. Literally, it says, gird your loins. In other words, uh, tuck your pants in and be prepared to start a fight. God's saying, get in your fighting stance. When I question you, you will inform me. Where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Job 38 goes on in verse 31 saying, Can you fasten the change of the Pleiades or loosen the belt of Orion? Can you bring out the constellations in their season and lead the bear and her cubs? Do you know the laws of heaven? Can you impose authority on earth? Can you command the clouds with the flood of waters covers you? Can you send out lightning bolts and they go? Do they report to you and say, here we are? And God goes on showing that he has given function and order and purpose for all the animals and creation that he has done and knows these things intimately. And finally, in chapter 40, Job responds with this weak, weak, I have spoken too much. And he tries to back down, realizing that he shouldn't have even started this fight. Husbands, if you said something to your wife out of jest, you would understand exactly how Job feels here. But God continues to make his point here. And in chapter 40 and 6 through 8, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Get ready to answer me like a man. When I question you, you will inform me. 
Would you really challenge my justice? Would you declare me guilty to justify yourself? In other words, Job had cried out and said, Hey, I'm a good person. Why are these bad things happening to me? And God is responding saying, You're questioning my justice? You're questioning the Father Almighty of why these things are happening? And he goes on by continuing to answer Job and explain and give this lesson by explaining that even the things that seem chaotic in the world around us are under God's reign and dominion as the king of the universe, the Lord of lords. And so to understand what God is saying here, I, I love this passage here. To understand this, we have to understand what God is saying to Job. What would this have meant to the ancient Middle Eastern, Near Eastern reader when they're reading this text? And so to understand that, we have to look at the fact that in the ancient Near East, they had these creation myths and other uh, stories about their gods. And in a lot of these, what happens is one of these gods fights a monster of chaos. And so they have these mythological creatures that represent the uh, scary, unknown world. Often the sea out in the horizon, the dark ocean, and there's these giant monsters that represent even the realm where the gods don't want to tread because there's no order, there's no understanding, it's, it's crazy. And so they use these symbols uh, like the behemoth and the leviathan. These are common creatures in these myths. And what the Bible says to us is, hey, those puny gods barely even managed to win a battle to establish order and push chaos off into the distant ocean or realm. God, the Father Almighty, in Genesis 121, he is the one that created heaven and earth. He has put order to the cosmos. And even the things that seem chaotic are part of that order. In Psalm 104, 26, it says these creatures are just going about their day, doing the function that God has created them and allowed them to do. And this is incredible. It's just a slam dunk in the face of the uh, ancient Near Eastern gods and people who worship them, that our God is the Father Almighty and their God is a weak, fake being. And so God here says this to Job in chapter 41, 1 through 5. Can you pull in Leviathan with a hook or tie his tongue down with a rope? Can you put a cord through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he beg you for mercy or speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you so that you can take him as a slave forever? Can you play with him like a bird or put him on a leash for your girls? Remember what we said here uh, towards the beginning about this term El Shaddai and the uh, political use of it in the uh, Assyrian and Persian and Babylonian empires, saying that, oh, our emperor is the Lord of Lords and the ultimate king who controls all. And even out in that wilderness where those chaos monsters are, our, our king is in charge of everything. God is saying here, hey, those fake gods barely even managed to win a battle to kick the chaos monster out into the ocean. I am the Father Almighty. Even the big, scary chaos monster, I can put a leash on that and take it around the street for a walk. Just like if you gave your adorable little girl just a cute little puppy and put it on a leash, that is what the scariest things of chaos around us are to me. They're on a leash by God. God is saying that even the chaos creatures are a part of his ordered world, that the Almighty Father who created heaven and earth even things that make no sense to us are on a leash for God. The point here is, Job, be strong and content. Don't think that you can domesticate or subdue God any more than you think you can subdue a Leviathan. And then Job repents of his pride in questioning God's justice. And so what do we do with this? As we look at the application and make sure we apply what we've just understood to ourselves, 
We ask ourselves, so what? What does it mean that God is the Father Almighty? So when I say, when we say together, reciting the creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That means that I choose to surrender my pride. I choose to surrender thinking that everything in this world should make sense to me, that I would be able to wrap my head around God's logic or to know what he is up to. Instead, it means to be humble and submit to the fact that God is almighty. He is good. He does not sin or do evil. He is just. He cannot be unjust. He is righteous. He is the sovereign ruler over all. And even what seems like absolute chaos in my life or the world around me is still under the king's rule and dominion, the almighty father. And perhaps this is something that is harder for uh, people who are younger to understand or people who have had a, maybe, I don't know, a really cushy life, or maybe if you're a new believer, this is something that's hard to surrender our pride and be humble before God with. And the reason with that is that those who have walked through the fire know that God is the one who delivered them from that. Those of us who walk these dangerous paths in life and have seen some stuff, we look back and see in faith that Christ is the one who led us through all of that safely and growing in him despite what pains we suffered along the way. It is like we said in week one about believing and having faith. It is an experience. It is not the experience and, oh, this feels right to me. It is, I know my Savior, because I have experienced him saving me. I have experienced him wiping away my sin debt. I have experienced him changing my heart. And I've experienced that through all these chaotic things happening in my life, these troubles, through sickness and all these different things or trials, Christ is the one that I was with. He was walking me, carrying me through these things. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, um, who was a uh, pastor in was in Nazi Germany trying to subvert the Nazis and seeing the atrocities that were taking place and eventually losing his own life in service to the kingdom of God. He observes that life with all of its hardships are what develop our faith. I want to read a quote from him here. Bonhoeffer said, I thought I could acquire faith by endeavoring to lead what might be termed a holy life. Later I discovered, I'm still discovering to this day, that one can acquire faith only by living amid the world's abundance of duties and problems, successes and failures, experiences and perplexities. If we do that, we cast ourselves completely into the arms of God. We take seriously not our own sufferings, but those of God in this world, and we share Christ's vigil in Gethsemane that I believe is faith, is metanoia, that's repentance, turning away from our, our old way of life. And that is how one becomes a human being and a Christian. I'm thankful to have recognized this, and I know that I could only have done so on the road I have traveled. That is why I reflect with gratitude and serenity on things past and present. Beyond faith and repentance, God is saying to us we need humility. Humility to submit to really saying, I believe God is the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and of earth. I'm never going to be able to fully understand why God does things the way he does, but I'm going to know that he is good and that he is for me as his child in Christ. How does this apply to your life today? How does this apply today and next week and the rest of the year and, and so on and so on? I mean, hey, there's only a global pandemic and an economic collapse uh, and these political shifts. And that's just what we're all having common experiencing today. Um, these other things, what, what seems like chaos in your life today that we need to submit to the Father Almighty saying, I don't understand this chaos around me, um, but I'm going to trust you and bring these things to you. So is it the fact that uh, maybe your kids aren't listening to you? 
Maybe your spouse seems distant from you. Maybe your boss is frustrating. Perhaps it's the fact that Joe Burrow tore up his knee. In all seriousness, is it unemployment? Is it sickness? Is it death? If you are a follower of Christ, that means you have a Father Almighty who created heaven and earth, and everything has to bow down to the King. You are able to come to Him and in honesty say to Him, I don't get this, God. Why does my loved one have to go through this sickness? Are they going to live? What am I going to do if I lose them? God, why did I have to lose my job? How am I going to pay the rent or the mortgage? Where are we going to live? How am I going to feed my family? God, why am I so alone? Whatever it is, just coming to God and saying, I need you. I want to trust you. God, please change my heart like James 1 that all these trials, let me rejoice through them knowing that you are making me more mature and closer to you. You are the king of the universe, almighty, and my father, and in control. I want to close here by sharing an example from Tim Challies that strikes the very real application and heart of God's almighty fatherhood for us. Challies is a pastor and a Christian blogger, and about a month ago, his son, who was away at college, died. He was uh, playing some kind of sports thing with his sister and fiance, and for reasons still unknown a month later, his heart just simply stopped and he died. And here, uh, about a week ago, Charlie's posted more information about this on his blog, and I want to share a quote from him on this. Charlie's writes, I feel the need to say that in all the pain and through all the tears, none of us have wavered in our conviction that God is good and that God expresses his goodness through his sovereignty. Nick's death was not a mistake and it was not meaningless. Even if we cannot see its purpose and the significance right now, none of us have raised a fist to the sky. Though each of us longs for answers, none of us have demanded them. These little bits of clay will not demand answers of the potter. In that way, and so many others, I'm so very proud of my little family and so very thankful for them. In this way, and so many others, they are passing through the deepest trials with their faith not only intact, but strengthened. I praise God for that. I ask, Father, that you would give me and those here this deep faith and humility and trust in you. I don't know how Chalice is able to continue in this faith. It's easy for us from a distance, but for him, I pray that you would strengthen his family. I pray that you would strengthen us in, in all of these trials to grow closer to you, to see that, Father, you are almighty, you are the creator, and you are good and just. I pray that anyone who's not following you, Lord, that you would use these chaotic things in life to humble them and break their heart open to see their need for non-justice, to be delivered from the penalty of sin, and to have a relationship with you. And so we remember what you've done for us and praise you by celebrating and remembering the Lord's Supper together and apart as you have commanded us to do. And so celebrating and remembering what Christ has done for us, him living a sinless life and dying and then rising again and ascending to heaven so that he will come back one day for us. Uh, we celebrate that by remembering the Lord's Supper. If you are um, not someone who follows Christ, we would ask that you would not participate. Um, however, you don't have to be a member of our church. You just have to be a member of God's family to participate in the Lord's Supper. 
And so what I'm going to do is I want to share this passage with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. The Apostle Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed. Take a moment and reflect on Christ meeting with his disciples on the night when he knows he's going to be betrayed, his friends are going to bail, and all the suffering that's going to take place that look chaotic to the disciples. And yet Christ absolutely knew that even the chaotic thing was all part of God's plan. Take a minute and reflect here on what Christ has accomplished for us. Jesus gave thanks, he broke the bread and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father God, thank you for being our Father, for providing a way for us to come to you. Thank you for being in control and letting us know you're in control. I pray you continue to move our hearts to trust you. We praise you for the gift of salvation for Christ, which you have accomplished on the cross and raising again. Thank you for that. We continue to proclaim it. Holy Spirit, I pray you would continue to move our hearts in growing closer to you and in giving us wisdom of what to understand and when to simply know we can't understand you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.